and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest today is Ixta Maya Murray, Professor of Law at Loyola Law School, Los Angeles. And we will be discussing two of her papers, or primarily discussing two of her papers. Uh, the first is FEMA Has Been a Nightmare, Epistemic Injustice in Puerto Rico, and Draft of a Letter of Recommendation to the Honorable Alex Kaczynski, which I guess I'm not going to send now. So uh, welcome, Maya. Brian, thank you so much for having me on this great podcast. I'm super excited to talk with you. Yeah, not, not half as excited as I am, I bet. Um, so... So I thought maybe we could start with your your paper about uh, FEMA and Puerto Rico because it's a little bit more like traditional legal scholarship. Although, you know, everything you do is so um, creative and unusual and formally sort of breaking a lot of boundaries that, you know, I mean, when I say it's more like a regular law profase, uh, like a like regular legal scholarship, you're still doing a lot of really interesting and unusual things in in the paper. I think um, so. I, I wanted to kind of maybe we could start if you could talk about the term epistemic injustice and what it means, and specifically what it means in relation to another term you use, uh, epistemic uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So, great. So, epistemic injustice is a term that was coined by Miranda Fricker among, I believe, maybe another philosopher, but Fricker's work is the one that I really focused on. And she wrote a book, well, or she published a book in 2009 called Epistemic Injustice. And what she talks about there is what happens when um, powerful people disregard more vulnerable populations as bearer of, bearers of facts, as being able to tell the truth, as being able to be reliable. And she talks about this in a couple of different ways. She talks about um, testimonial injustice, which is where it can actually occur in one of two situations. One is where a, def a person uh, gives testimony but is because of their personal characteristics, their race, their gender, their sexuality, their class, um, their disability, um, sexuality, I, I don't know if I've already talked about that, so that they are disbelieved, that they are not deemed to be credible. Hmm. And so that's one way in which testimonial injustice can occur. And the other is where they're not consulted at all. And so um, the world is constructed without their input, the social and legal world of the powerful uh, is constructed without their input. And the second type of injustice that she talks about is hermeneutic injustice, which is where people in power have not come up, with, like nobody has come up with language to describe a particular harm. And so Fricker describes, uh, so what were women who were experiencing sexual harassment how did they how did they deal with their experiences uh how do you say it avant la lettre which is mm. i guess french for um before it was coined before it was named right right and so that's fricker's uh interest and she says that people have a, a great uh, amount of trouble um assimilating that information uh into their experience they don't know what to do with it and that creates a vicious circle so that you don't have a language to describe what's happening for you. You worry that what's happening to you is nothing as a consequence, and thus you seem less credible when you do testify. Mm -hmm. And so these ideas became interesting for me um, I, in the last uh, couple of years. Since about 2012, 2013, I've started to do work that's uh, heavily reliant upon going into communities of color and some low-income communities and doing um, interviews with people, um, sometimes lawyers, but primarily not, um, people who are, are experiencing eviction as a result of gentrification, people um, who have experienced sexual violence, and um, people who are dealing with other types of loss. And I ask them things like, uh, so what are you going through? What's, what are you experiencing? What, what does the Constitution say about, what are your constitutional rights? I asked them about their perceptions mm. of the Constitution. And then I try to write up 
um, what I call community constitutionalism, which is community definitions of uh, constitutional rights and constitutional injuries is a way to try to get those voices into mainstream um, jurisprudence uh, and you know law reviews. Mm -hmm. So within that work, I, I learned that there were a lot of there were a lot of spaces within I, I would ask people, so, so what are your rights? And there was a gap and there was, you know, there were questions and there was a lot of angst. Uh, and oftentimes we would have arguments like uh, they would say, well, the Constitution says this. And I would say, well, I don't know if it does say that. I think it might say something entirely the opposite. And then we would have these arguments and I would come across as this kind of horrible lawyer who was oppressing them because I was describing what I understood to be the constitutional issues and uh, the Supreme Court's uh, resolution of those issues. But then I would listen to what they had to say. And I said, you know, what you're saying is really important. Let me write this down and try to try to uh, try to create a, an alternative constitutional reading um, mm. based on your own uh, interpretations of it, which are so valuable. And so Fricker's work became really important because, because these interviewees and I together were working against the tide of, of hermeneutic and testimonial injustice. Mm -hmm. because they had never been consulted. And when they were asked about what their constitutional rights there, they typically weren't lawyers. And so they didn't, weren't regarded as authorities who could speak to what the constitution says or should say. Mm -hmm. But in fact, what I found that very often uh, for people of color uh, developed uh, readings of the constitution that were they were oftentimes radical, but they often had a great deal of resonances with prestige, progressive constitutional theory. Mm -hmm. And so um, that, that, that was just, you know, us trying to work through uh, epistemic injustice and to create a new language uh, where it didn't, where it doesn't thus far maybe exist uh, within mainstream jurisprudence. Right. Right. Well, so my reading of your your paper on Puerto Rico suggested to me that in that context, you were primarily talking about testimonial injustice in the sense yeah. that FEMA wasn't listening to the people in Puerto Rico or, or was, in a sense, I, I wanted to say kind of like silencing people by like pretending that they they didn't exist in the first place, like never asking for what people's needs were. And I was wondering yeah. if you could talk a little bit about kind of how that played out on the ground, because I mean, the things you describe in the paper are just horrifying and, and, and terrifying. Um, and, and, I, and I'm not entirely sure that everyone's fully aware of, of what took place. Um, and then you, I thought you talked really powerfully about this sort of idea of epistemic uncertainty and how that wasn't really the problem that was presented in the context. Right. So, so um, last September twentieth, September twentieth, two thousand and seventeen, Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico and caused all of this harm and all this damage, as we all know. And in November, I started doing interviews, primarily over the phone, um, with people who had survived the hurricane. And also, I got a hold of a nurses' union that had sent, RNRN, which had sent um, many nurses uh, to the island to do uh, public health and to do on the ground care for people who were experiencing uh, health problems or who had been injured from the, by the hurricane. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I didn't, you know, whenever I, I start these projects, I don't know what I'm, what's going to happen. I don't know what I'm going to find. But everyone that I spoke with uh, was extremely well. They were they were hostile and they were very disappointed with FEMA's response uh, to the people of Puerto Rico, and that has finally that has definitely trickled um, into uh, journalistic accounts. And then there was a Harvard and George Washington study about the death toll that has now received a lot of notice. But in November of 2017. Uh, my interviewees were telling me facts that I hadn't really even read in newspaper articles. Mm. So simultaneously, um, around October, you know, around November 1st, 
late October, November 3rd, President Trump, Brock Long, who's the uh, FEMA administrator, the head guy, and several senators said, look, the problem is that Puerto Rico is an island. Um, President Trump said um, it's surrounded by big water. So he had to explain to people that Puerto Rico is situated in a body of water. And they just kept on talking about how the logistics were so impossible and that why, that's why aid was so difficult to deliver to Puerto Ricans. But when I spoke to um, the folks who survived and, I, and the folks who had been there in November of 2017, they said, listen, First of all, we don't even see any FEMA people here. We, it's mm. very rare to find a FEMA uh, investigator on the ground. Second, they're handing out applications instead of giving aid. Third, they're relying on technology. They're, they're announcing their presence in parts of the community through Twitter, and they require computer processing uh, of the FEMA applications uh, through, uh, through, a, through the computer. But mm -hmm. the problem is Puerto Ricans have problems with poverty and so are unlikely to have intelligent devices in the first place. Right. And in the second place, the power grid went down on September 20th. <laughs> and even those people who did have technology can't access it anymore because there's just no power anywhere that anybody can find. Wow. So moreover, to the extent that FEMA agents, according to my interviewees, were not just running around shoving pieces of paper or applications of people, uh, they were giving some small quantities of food and water, but not, so it's like a Woody Allen movie, like um, the food so bad and in such small portions. <laughs> I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was kind of like that, it was just so dark. I mean, so they barely gave out any food, but the food that they did give was toxic to many of the people who uh, were stranded or had just survived this hurricane because uh, in accordance, and uh, and as we all understand, that when, when people are experiencing poverty, there are higher rates of diabetes and hypertension. And so you're looking at 50% hypertension. I can't remember the de the deets now, the statistics, but there was there's a very high incidence of diabetes and a, and a much higher incidence of prediabetes. Mm. And FEMA agents were distributing uh, cookies and uh, according to my interviewees and pieces of beef jerky and beef things jerky. like that, yeah. that were full of sucrose and salt and thus were toxic to people with these conditions. And finally, they didn't speak, FEMA agents did not speak Spanish. Yeah. So they're showing you were, up. You were saying like the, the, pre, the prevalence of monolingualism in Puerto Rico is even higher than I'd realized. Yes, it's high. It's high. And uh, self-reported monolingualism is a, it was in 2015, according to Fox, uh, two million, something like that. Uh, it was very high. It's like and, 50%, really, right? Yeah. So, right. So, um, the FEMA, agent, FEMA agents were hard to find when they did show up. It was through technology. When they were giving out food, it was often toxic to the people uh, uh, receiving it. And they didn't speak the language of the people. Yeah. So all of this is part of the logistics explanation. So when Trump and Brock Long and these senators were saying, look, the problem is logistics, what they were saying was there was there's something so inscrutable about Puerto Rico that we don't really know how to get there and, and get over those hills and get through the, you know, get through the streets and stuff. We don't know how to get stuff there. We know how to get men on the moon. We know how to sift the sands to find bin Laden and execute him surgically. We know how to do all of these amazingly cool things. We know how, how to build an actual, I researched this. A lot, we've done, the United States has done lots of logistically amazingly complicated things like build a city under the Greenland ice sheet, something like that. Like we, like we're, awesome we can do lots of amazing things but we can't get some food and uh, non-toxic food and water and spanish speakers to well that seems very strange yeah what i read was that they were saying 
you know, there's something like this is the dark side of the moon, man. Like Puerto Rico, who knows? Who knew? Puerto Rico, wow. But when I was speaking to my interviewees, they said they don't even know who we are. They never consulted us. They don't understand how we live. And so they can't help us. And what this wound up creating was yet another vicious circle. It looks like a lot of people experience something that psych psychologists call analysis paralysis. Because just a week before uh, in Houston, uh, several days before, two weeks before in Houston, Brock Long had said, basically, we're crushing it in Houston. Uh, we're, we are we're totally crushing it in Houston, you know, because what he said is we're in a deep life. This is a direct quote. We are in a deep life saving mission in Houston uh, from Hurricane Harvey, I think it was. Mm. And so FEMA was kind of wrapping itself in this, this, this glory of, of life saving heroics. And people in Puerto Rico might have, you know, heard that and think, well, they're going to come and, and do a deep life saving mission to help me. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're waiting around, like, what do I do? Nobody's showing up. A lot, there was a big problem with people in the mountain communities. And my interviewee said that a lot of the FEMA agents stayed in the safety of San Juan, which is a metropolitan area. But the, mm -hmm. the real problem or a lot of problem apparently existed in the mountain areas where people would be stranded for weeks without any help. Yeah. So the problem was that, you know, nobody knew the, the FEMA agents, the, as I understand it, just did not understand the realities of these people because they hadn't been consulted. Yeah. So that's what I wrote about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that I thought was like incredibly in effective and really incisive about your paper was that like you, you really took the statements from the president and from Brock Long and from FEMA in general, like at face value yeah. and engaged with them through the literature on risk and uncertainty mm -hmm. and epistemic injustice and, and really kind of showed how disengaged from reality they, they really were. And I was wondering if you could just say a little something about that, because I thought that was a really effective part of your paper, sort of like the way you distinguish between uncertainty and risk, and then talk about how it was, those concepts were really misapplied under the circumstances and kind of showed that that wasn't, was, that wasn't what was taking place. Well, that's right. So, so I was trying to grapple with, with the idea of uncertainty because when, when President Trump said, oh my gosh, Puerto Rico's in a bunch of water, and then he also said, oh my gosh, uh, this unexpected and unprecedented hurricane hit Puerto Rico. You never hear of a five. In fact, Maria was a four, though three miles shy of, shy of a five. And everybody else was talking about logistics. I thought that what they were saying was, we just don't, we can't be certain what's happening in Puerto Rico. It is, it is an inscrutable, it's a dark place on the map, right? It's mm -hmm. kind of like, like in the 19th century, like it's, it's a dark corner of the world and we're here uh, venturing into this unknown land. And so it was what I call, I said it was, I describe it as an uncertainty defense. And so I wound up looking at this literature on uncertainty, which has helpfully been written for us by scholars such as Cass Sunstein and Robert Burchick and Dan Farber, uh, uh, and they've all written about this concept of uncertainty and they say uncertainty is where there's no way to gauge the risk. Mm. Uh, you just can't understand how to balance out costs and benefits. And they, and what, what they often write about are things like climate change. Like we just don't understand what's coming. Mm -hmm. So how do you balance the pros and the cons or what do you, how do you plan for the future in, in the face of this kind of uncertainty? Mm. And this is opposed to risk which is something that you can calculate. Right. And so what I said is the government is in terms of uh, the administ FEMA administrator, the president and the senators are, are uh, invoking an uncertainty defense. But in fact, everything that they are describing was either a calcul calculable risk, mm -hmm. that is it's hurricane season, 
and right it's hurricane yeah. season. who who would who would have thought that a hurricane yeah. might come during hurricane season? like who knew like who knew and that many very powerful hurricanes have gone through the region in the past and there's a, you know since we've been writing history uh the people in the caribbean have been complaining and talking about hurricanes so it's cal you know it's calculable risk risk and when it wasn't just risk, it was what, um, what is it, Schwarzkopf described, I probably am getting it wrong, as a known known? Uh, Rumsfeld, I think. Rumsfeld, right, who I can, right, who knows, one of these guys. Rumsfeld, right, Rumsfeld said uh, there are unknown unknowns and known unknowns and then there are known knowns, yeah. uh, which is when you know what you know. Uh, and I said, we know this, it's a known known. Um, you know, we've on been, a, been on official notice since uh, the late 1800s when we acquired Puerto Rico that it's in water. And I started laying out all the yeah. obvious things. We know that uh, Puerto Rico is in effective bankruptcy. Like that's not news. Yeah. Uh, that there were tons of studies about the physical health of Puerto Ricans and how poverty had uh, impacted their health so that they were more likely to experience diabetes and hypertension. Um, everybody knew that the power grid was out on September 20th. Like these were not mysteries. So um, what's happening here is that the federal government, and a lot of people when I talked about this or when they read my, my draft said, but what the government is saying is just garbage. Mm -hmm. Like it's just garbage. I'm not paying any attention to that because it's garbage. And what I did, as you as you note, know, is I, I paid serious attention to it. Yeah. And I, I derived two conclusions from, from that language. One which is um, obvious. Um, one, the first being that um, they didn't, that the government, these governmental actors did not regard Puerto Ricans as human beings. Mm. Like, you know, you're not, you're not really a thing. You don't have a culture that's worthy of recognition. You don't. You don't even exist, man. Like that was kind of the reaction that I see that happening between the government and Puerto Rico. And second, that the shocking cognitive uh, unavailability—that's Sunstein's phrase—this lack of awareness was so shocking to the people of Puerto Rico that they just did not know how to react. Uh, I mean, first of all, how do you react to a hurricane anyway? But when you hear people speaking insanely like this, how what do you what do you do? I mean, do you think, well, they're not coming, or do you think, well, they were just in Houston, maybe they will show up? And so it, it created it 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 actually contributed, I I believe, to the death toll because people don't know how to react to what's something that seems insane. Yeah, and that's yeah. That's what I wrote about. Yeah, because it's, it's just something like weirdly like, like a like a like a comedy or something like a, yeah. a dark comedy in the sense yeah. that like oh, a sensible person would be like, "What are you talking about? Like, you didn't know that we were an island. You didn't know that there were mountains. You didn't know that people here were poor that they spoke Spanish. Yeah. I mean, come yeah. on, man." Yeah, right. And 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 one of my interviewees kept on emphasizing that it was like a nightmare, that it's been a nightmare. And, I, and that language, it's, I don't think is just a, a toss away phrase. I think there was a sense of, you really had to grapple to think this is, this is reality. This is actually reality right now. Yeah. I'm not, it's not, it's actually happening. Yeah. This yeah. is well, terrible. I mean, just so terrible. We're looking at a body count of 4,000. And, yeah. and, you know, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, the poor, people of Puerto Rico uh, have demonstrated tons of resilience, tons of um, self-help, tons of community uh, engagement. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't want to paint a picture where there are these abject, helpless mm -hmm. people, because they're not. I mean, they're articulate, they're angry, the people I spoke to, mm -hmm. um, they, they, really attempt, they really attempted, in many cases, succeeded in responding to a life threat, a life and property threat, but that being said, um, the government hurt them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and it's interesting because talking to you, it really helps me like understand in a way how, you know, at least one of the things that I think made the paper so effective was the, in the sense that like, 
you know, ironically, you know, you listened both to the government and to the people who you were talking to, and then based the paper on what you learned from what people said. Mm -hmm. So it was like, almost like in the paper you were, I felt like you were trying to push back against the very kinds of hermeneutic frameworks that mm -hmm. create the epistemic injustice you were talking about. Well, so what I wound up doing, um, I can't remember the name of, she, of, this, of this writer who went uh, to Chernobyl and did all of, I, I was reading her, I can't remember her name, sorry, I'm gonna have to come back to you with that one, but no she did all these interviews with people in Chernobyl and she um, wound up writing these books where she would just set forth these interviews and they were devastating, just devastating. And she is not present in the book at all, except as a deliverer of these interviews. Mm -hmm. And that style was very influential on me. I thought that I would just, what I did is I, I dedicated a large section of the paper just to try to remove myself, except as a watcher, as a hearer, mm -hmm. um, and to, to allow the voices of these interviewees really take over the paper and to tell the truth. And so that's, that's what I, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do is to. Yeah. Places yeah. Right well, I mean, and, I thought, I thought it yeah. was incredibly effective. I mean, like really powerful, but also like really powerful in kind of an emotional and effective sense, but also really powerful in like a rhetorical, like, convincing sense and it mm -hmm. it really made me that much more receptive to not just the sort of practical recommendations and observations that you made but the more kind of as when I say epistemic ones like how should we approach or what what should we learn from these mistakes or what should the government learn from mm -hmm. these mistakes about how to approach similar kinds of problems in in the future. And I was wondering if, if maybe you, you could talk a little bit about that and then we could talk also about your, your, your Kaczynski paper, which is okay. really fascinating. You're saying what should we do in the future? Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know how when people say, I think this is two papers, mm -hmm. they're always two papers. I'm always writing two papers, <laughs> but this time I actually turned it into two papers. Uh huh. So it turned out that the, so I wound up publishing or getting accepted into the Willamette Law Review, and that's where this uh, article that you're talking about so kindly uh, will be published. Um, and at the end, I say, I mean, it's pretty basic what to do from here. Mm -hmm. um, what needs to happen is that we need to create space within the, the Stafford Act is the instrument under which FEMA operates. Uh, under which uh, disaster aid, uh, the president is empowered to um, organize and deliver disaster aid through the agencies. Mm -hmm. and, I was, and I was just saying, there are spaces within the Stafford Act and within this, these body regulations where life stories and life ways can be heard by the government uh, and incorporated into a data bank and consulted and used in the event of future disasters or even to think about how to prepare in advance for disasters. And this should be done for all vulnerable communities that are now hermeneutically um, neglected. Mm -hmm. And then I wound up in a second paper, which I'm, I'm going to, that's almost pretty much done at this point. Hmm. Um, I wound up looking to the theory of administrative constitutionalism written by the likes of Julian Metzger and Karen Tani and all these other amazing people who write about the ways in which administrative actors can help create new constitutional norms within agencies, even mm -hmm when there is judicial hostility to an expansive view of rights. Mm -hmm. And so there is some track record of, of administrators and, and agency actors of thinking broadly and creatively and expansively about civil rights and human rights. And there's also this other doctrine, question mark, of bureaucratic resistance from below, Mm -hmm. um, written about the first person that I read about in this in these lights was Jennifer New. Um, she wrote really persuasively about 
um, agents in administration, in agencies um, who could rebel. You know, what does it mean to rebel within an agency and to uh, do something your own way uh, and to be a, the little guy who uh, resists or leaks or mm -hmm. quits or, you know, argues or does something anyway. And so I tried to bring together these two ideas and I said, we need a change of at least FEMA culture so that um, active listening to the underclass becomes a part of its practice. Right. And I looked at the culture of FEMA, I looked at its training manuals, and there is no such culture uh, as, as far as I can tell, and, and the proof is in the pudding mm -hmm. right now. And so in the end, I actually wind up arguing, I, I, I'm trying to speak to, so the, the, the culture up top with Brock Long and with the president is, is wholly degraded. Um, I mean, we've seen that. Uh, we see it in, in the way in which Puerto Rico was handled. And we also just see it in, in so many different types of ways with the president's reaction to uh, people who have been harmed, either from sexual violence or in Puerto Rico itself. It's just, mm -hmm. there's, there just seems to be no hope there. It's really, it's very despairing. And so I wound up writing a small essay at the end that was directed towards uh, pe you know, kind of a, somebody a little lower down on the totem pole from Brock Long, who seems wholly uh, captured by Trump. And I said, you know, there are lots of different ways that you can create culture from below. And I've done lots of readings in um, nonviolence theory and nonviolence history. And there's this nice tradition of just getting together in groups of two, three, five, ten, and having conversations or together reading a book that has uh, later led to things like peace movements in Eastern mm -hmm. Germany uh, and also led to the intersectional uh, movement within feminism. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I say, you know, let's, you know, if you want to start a book group, I think you should. I yeah. think you should start, I think you guys should start reading Toni Morrison in the middle of FEMA. Yeah. <laughs> so, so anyway, you know, that's, yeah. That's, what I was, that's what I came up with. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, and it, weirdly, I feel like that's a fantastic bridge to your other, uh, your other paper uh, on Alex Kaczynski in the yeah. sense that I have to say, like, reading it, I really felt like you did such a fantastic job of laying out in a kind of formally creative way the experience of the kind of hermeneutic injustice you were talking mm. about earlier. So, um, okay, so I, you know, Brian, so kind to talk about these, these, I've been writing these strange pieces, which are um, fiction. And I've been publishing them and placing them in law reviews. And there's a, as we know, there's a long tradition of narrative method within critical legal, critical race theory. Um, and I'm, I'm uh, building upon and looking to that tradition. And what I wind up doing is I write, I create these characters who thereafter write either legal memos or letters from law offices or from law professors offices where they deal with these incredibly stressful uh, social legal problems. Mm -hmm. So in one previous article, I, it's titled A Modest Memo, I came up with a character um, who wanted to work for President-elect Trump, then President-elect Trump, and so wound up writing this long memo about how he could use the UN Security Council to issue sanctions against Mexico and thus raise money for the wall. Mm. And, it, and it turned, you know, and it devolves into this paranoid, um, <laughs> you know, screed at the end where mm -hmm. the author is evidently uh, suffering some kind of mental malaise and, uh, and also just kind of alienated in his own right. And uh, what I also learned in that, in that work was actually how feasible of the proposal was, and it's mm -hmm. titled A Modest Memo after Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal. <laughs> yeah. And so then I've been doing this in lots of other different contexts, but when um, the Kaczynski uh, allegations started to surface, 
uh, it was so hard on, I think it was so hard for a lot of us uh, to see that happen. Um, I'm, I, so I have this, like so many people, I, I admire Judge Kaczynski for his, I mean, so he's an immigrant, he has uh, an accent, um, he's a nerd, uh, he has, you know, glasses, and yet he just crushed the judiciary. He just, he kind of leapt up there at the age of 35. I, I really disagree with him on so many of his opinions. <laughs> but he has so much style and so much bravado mm -hmm. that, and I grew up and I graduated in 1993, his was the clerkship to get. I mean, he mm -hmm. was the star. Mm -hmm. And so simultaneously when, you know, I would read these opinions of his, which I just thought were gross, I would also think, oh, you know, there's Judge Kaczynski. He's such a, he's such a rock star. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to be a rock star like Judge Kaczynski. You know, these are my secret little thoughts as I'm thinking about his career. And then it turns right. out that there's this just very deeply, deeply depressing fact of him sexually harassing, according to these reports, these women in his post as a Ninth Circuit judge. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, and I started to write this, so I started to write a letter of recommendation, a fictional letter of recommendation, mm -hmm. pretty much the day after the first allegations came out. So there was a bit of a story arc with Kaczynski. It began mm -hmm. with people saying, he, you know, me too. Uh, he asked me to look at porn. Uh, he did this and he, you know, he was, he touched me on the chest. It was unclear. There was no breast groping allegation yet. There was mm -hmm. no thigh grope groping allegation yet. And so he still seemed safe. There were a few days where he seemed, still seemed well, okay. And he came out into the press and he said, um, if this is all I've been able to come up with, then I'm not worried. Mm -hmm. And I thought as a law professor, how could I, how could I ever write a letter of recommendation for a female, for any student to go to mm -hmm. his chambers? But at the same time, he's a feeder judge. So what would I do if a student wanted me to write a letter? I mean, do you write it or you mm -hmm. do not write it? Yeah. And how do you write it? So what I wound up doing is writing a fictional letter of recommendation. And, and, as, and then it started to snowball and all his clerks quit. And then, then he retired because the allegations became more and more grotesque. Mm -hmm. um, but I wound up writing a letter where I tried to deal with the hard, the hard questions. You know, in, in law, you always have to write as if from one perspective, like this is my argument, this is mm -hmm. correct, um, this is the case. Mm -hmm. But in literature, uh, in literature, literature is radiant. In, in, in the literary world, you know, like in, with, I teach law and literature, like in Oedipus Rex, uh, Oedipus is both guilty and innocent. And mm -hmm. in Hamlet, he's, Hamlet is both sane and uh, insane. And I'm not saying that Kaczynski is both guilty and not guilty of sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is that there were these, 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 this, my history with Kaczynski, my admiration for his, for Kaczynski, for his, his success, right? Mm -hmm. Um, was this factor that, that gave me so much nostalgia and kind of angst at the same time that I thought there's no, this guy has to leave. So, and so I wound up writing this letter of recommendation where there are lots of cross outs. Mm -hmm. And you, so it's, it's what's called foul matter within publishing, as I'm sure you know. Mm. Um, you know, it's your, your first draft and it's, it's just the draft with all the edits in it. And it's just, this is horrible. Yeah. And then I also had it, I had another character come in who is a colleague of this fictional law professor trying to write a letter, a letter of recommendation to Judge Kaczynski for a woman of color student of hers. Mm -hmm. And then the idea is that she gives, the, she doesn't know what to do with this letter. So she gives it to a colleague mm -hmm. who then edits it with comment bubbles or he's giving the other side of the story, which is Me Too is a panic, mm -hmm. and we're overreacting, and uh, you're not doing your student any favors, and it's part of your job to write these letters of recommendation. And so uh, in the end, uh, the conclusion is that uh, he should resign. Mm -hmm. He should resign. But I felt happy about being able to stumble across this 
method or style where everything got really complicated and ugly because that's yeah. how I think it was. Well, I mean, what blew me away, what I really love about that paper is how you use all of the kind of the, the formal elements derived from sort of a, a word like, you know, edited like review document in order to sort of sh like metaphorically show the kind of internal conceptual or you know, kind of normative tensions or I guess like hermeneutic or conceptual tensions around, you know, language and and right and wrong and normative values and, you know, the sort of internal tensions in sort of trying to express why this is wrong in a context that doesn't want to admit that it's wrong. Yeah. And the, right. the, the way that you use them is kind of these ruptures into the narrative of the story that you're telling. Um, and, the art, and really the argument that you're making, it gives it like so many different layers in a really fascinating and like, like it, it requires the reader to engage with what you're doing formally and as a work of literature, not just in terms of an argument. Thank you. Yes. So that's, that's what I was trying to achieve. Uh, so there are all these cross outs where this character is dealing with her own past because, you know, she's thinking, geez, this is really bad. This is making me remember things that happened to me. And I'm feeling really, I'm feeling my, like my own life is implicated by this. Mm -hmm. And she starts writing about herself and then she's crossing it all out, but the cross outs are visible. And that I, I thought, and then there's also all this, it's kind of a David Foster Wallace scene uh, footnote frenzy at the bottom. There's all this stuff going on in the footnotes where she's freaking out in the footnotes as well, but, mm -hmm. but they're at the same time literate and uh, dealing with the legal issues. And it, I was just trying to express how within the law in this profession, the, the, the dictates of professionalism um, are such that you cannot, there's so many things that are impossible to express. Mm -hmm. this the qualities of being a human being of of suffering of being confused you're not allowed to be confused as a lawyer or a law professor you're not allowed to be baffled or stunned um you have to always be in control mm -hmm. of your case of your argument and sometimes um these events make you feel destabilized and so i was really excited to be able to introduce a form of writing into a legal periodical mm -hmm. where those myths are debunked mm -hmm. and simultaneously um i was really worried about um in the legal academy's own participation in in, in this strikes so close to home in our support of Judge Kaczynski because, you know, he's a star and we all wanted him at our dinner banquets and we all wanted him to speak at our events. Even though as of 2008, we started to get the message that maybe he didn't have the most progressive views on gender because he was hoarding all of this porn. But, but at the same time, you don't want to be a nag or a scold or anti-sex or anything. Mm -hmm. He's allowed to be a human being too. So all of these things, all of these confusions, as, as you so beautifully described, were, or they just erupt in this letter of recommendation. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and somehow like when I was reading it, it reminded me of like one of my favorite recent books, um, Dear Committee Members. Um, oh, yeah. And the same way that this kind of very kind of formal discourse gradually breaks down and the underlying like emotional and social tensions start to erupt out of it. And it just occurred to me that it seemed like such a perfect format for expressing what I think is at least one aspect of what has made the Me Too movement so powerful in the sense that there's almost like, there's been like this social refusal to hear how 
like various yeah. kinds of social expectations make people feel like mm -hmm. in real life. And mm -hmm. like you, you, it just, it's like it erupts out of the language in this really, like it makes it that much more powerful and visceral to me. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was, it was definitely, uh, there are moments of either ecstasy or catharsis or I think it's probably more catharsis than Brechtian estrangement, just really flipping out and trying to speak the truth, but then you suppress it, mm -hmm. and you suppress it. which I think is a, a big experience of teaching. You know, you're teaching these really intense things. I mean, people, in cases, people are dying, uh, people are divorcing, children are getting abused. Um, people are getting raped. I teach criminal law. And then, and everybody in the room has some experience with trauma and violence. Some, everybody in the room has an experience with loss. And as a student and as a professor, you, you are being trained in how to organize that, that experience so that it, it supposedly can't hurt you. Mm -hmm. And there's something very strange about that. Yeah. Which I talk about a lot in my law and literature class. Yeah, yeah. So I, brain, was... I, brain, I brainwash my students in criminal law, and then, and then I try to, you know, give them an opportunity to have a breakdown in law and literature. Yeah, God, I, I imagine it's an amazing class. I would, okay. be, I would be delighted to take it myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, you know, this has been such yeah. a pleasure talking to you about this. And I can only say, I mean, I'm really looking forward to digging deeper into your work because I've enjoyed everything I've read so far so much. You're very generous. I'm so happy to have been able to speak with you today. Great. Well, I, uh, I, I, I hope to talk to you soon. I, me too. Okay. <laughs>